Welcome everyone to 3 p.m. and our last conference talk in track two. We've got John Stoner here with us today, being a better defender by channeling your worst adversary, lessons learned building adversary emulations. John's a principal security strategist at Splunk, where he's uh, working to educate and improve users' capabilities in security operations, threat hunting, incident response, and threat intelligence. Uh, he's written some hands-on workshops that focus on working on those specific security skills. You can find those on the Splunk blogs. Uh, he enjoys problem solving. That's good. Uh, <laughs> with the job you've Low got, fruit. Uh, writing and educating. When he's not doing cyber things, he enjoys reading or binge watching the TV series that you've already watched. Uh, during the fall and winter, you can find him driving his boys to hockey rinks across the northeastern U.S. He also enjoys listening to what his teammates call '80s sad timey music. You'll see, John. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I realize the last slot almost of the last day of the conference is always the prime time. So, A, thank you for sticking with us, number one. Number two, I'm glad we didn't have to move everybody, including the camera folks, out to the pool, that everybody's sitting out there is a little bit too breezy. So I guess everybody came in. So that's great. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, you know lessons learned building adversary emulations. And again, as was mentioned before, this is a little bit different than probably somebody who is looking to do, uh, you know, the pen testing, the red team route, right? Because well, for starters, that's not what I do. Um, I'm, I'm more the blue team guy. Uh, we do uh, a blue team capture the flag. Uh, we help up level analysts. We try to make them better at their jobs. And so that's what a lot of these pieces that I'm going to be talking about are things that I've learned as I've been building these uh, adversary emulations over the past couple of years. Um, yesterday during the keynote, right, Derek mentioned partnerships. Uh, I try to write it down because otherwise I can't keep track of this stuff. Partnerships, not adversaries, are attempts to be better um, with the blue team, right? And that kind of resonated with this overall concept of the things that we're trying to do. So that's, as I'm talking, that's kind of the frame of reference that I'm coming from. Um, you heard the bio already, uh, Twitter handles there. Um, and yeah, specifically the Smiths, you'll see a couple of references to what, what would probably be called 80s sad timing music out there. I'll let you guys figure out which ones those are. In the next 45 minutes, kind of the three high level concepts, methods to emulate the adversary, share what we've done, provide some of those lessons learned that if you guys decide you want to do things like this, that you can learn from those things that we didn't do quite so well. Uh, yesterday, um, Adams talked about a little bit about Red Canary and advers uh, emulating adversaries. Um, you know, if you want to do unit testing, you can certainly do unit testing out there. That's a good way to emulate uh, specific adversary actions. Uh, you can automate those things, right? There's Caldera, MITRE Caldera. That's Yellowstone Caldera, different Caldera, same concept though, right? You can do the automated testing. There's lots of things out there. We're not talking about those kinds of things here. We're actually talking about kind of rolling up our sleeves, building this thing, and then running it end to end, and then doing stuff with that data set. And the reason we do that is because there's lots of different things you can accomplish when you're trying to build your adversary emulation. High level prevention, detection, response, forensics. A lot of what we're doing is focusing on the detection side of this, okay? Because at the end of the day, that's what we do at Splunk, right? We focus on detection. We focus on trying to go ahead and basically bridge the data gap, um, because if we can't see it, we can't hunt it. If we can't hunt it, we can't detect it. Okay. And that's what we want to focus on. Bots. Anybody play bots? Bots. Okay. Bots is our blue team capture the flag. We started in 2016, building it to be realistic, to be a competition. And where I've kind of taken this is to try to do some of the training pieces of this. So, we built a company called Frothly. Frothly is a brewing, what do I call this? They're a brewing supply company is where they started off, okay? You need to have a, you need to have a victim, but the victim shouldn't be your own organization, right? It could be, right? But we're not gonna attack Splunk, right? That would kind of be a bad thing. What we wanted to do was we wanted to have a, something to go after. And so we created Frothly. Frothly has characters and personas. Grace, uh, Hoppy is the CEO, okay? 
Grace has an entire team out there of folks. Okay, and what she's trying to do is she's trying to run her, bra her, her uh, brewing company and she's got representative personas inside of that. Marketing, R&D, IT. You guys have those kinds of things in your companies, right? Of course. What we wanted to do was have a representative organization so that when they're attacked, we can focus on a specific persona who's being attacked and the specific, specific actions of that persona, okay? Now, if you wanted to do an adversary emulation in your own organization, you could certainly do that, but you don't want to pick on Bob in accounting. You don't want to pick on Frida in marketing, right? Because at the end of the day, we're not into victim shaming here. What we're trying to do is trying to go ahead and create that emulation. And so when we're adversary, um, emulating the adversary, we also have to have a victim that we're emulating, okay? And that's what we've done here. The other thing that we've done with this is we built this in such a way that if we want to scale this over time, and change the landscape around it, we can do that. So when we started the brewing supply company, it was just a brewing supply company. We wanted to emulate a Kubernetes attack. Well, we hired developers for Frothly, right? And so this kind of became a little bit of a sitcom kind of thing where you're adding different pieces to this. Uh, we wanted to emulate an ICS scenario. They bought an organization called Thirsty Burner, which was a brewery because we had a brewery with ICS system. Right? And we want to monitor those things. So these are the kinds of things that we did to, uh, to emulate the victim part of this. right? And then the other part of this, is obviously, is emulating the adversary. Okay? Now, the adversary can be a different personas depending upon the scenario that you want to do. If you want to emulate an insider threat, you got to come up with that insider threat for your organization. If you want to look at nation state, same kind of thing. If you want to do cyber criminal, that's fine. There's different ways that we can go ahead and emulate our adversary. We just need to start with that persona, figure out what that persona is, and go from there. What I'm going to talk about is the nation state piece, which is the one that I've kind of been focusing on over the past couple of years. Now, before we dive into the nation state piece, anybody ever seen the diamond model? Just a quick show of hands. I kind of ask these kinds of questions for, for feedback here. All right. So about half the people raise their hand. The idea behind the diamond model is to be able to kind of show the interrelationships between an adversary, their victim, the infrastructure, and the capabilities. And so a couple of really, really smart guys wrote this white paper a long time ago. You can check out the links. I'll post the slides. And you can read all about the diamond model in concept. Anybody ever see Star Wars? All right. Great. About half the people. Same thing. Okay, good, guys. Thanks. Um, Threat connected a blog on the diamond model and applying the diamond model to Star Wars and specifically the Battle of Yavin a couple of years ago. And it's a great way to contextualize the diamond model in a way that you know you could probably grab onto. And the idea here, without going into this whole Star Wars thing, because I assume a few of you guys have seen it, it sounds like, uh, is there's that relationship between the capabilities of the adversary, the, the infrastructure and the victim, the adversary and the victim, et cetera, right? Because each of those vertices has a relationship. And then the east-west is the technical relationship. The north-south is the socio-political, okay? So I can go ahead and use something like this and I start building out my, um, I start building out my, uh, my, my, uh, my scenario. And so this first one that we did with the nation state was focusing on a couple of capabilities like PowerShell Empire, because it was about 2017. PowerShell Empire was something we were seeing a lot of out there. So, we thought we'd go ahead and you know, take a look, build an, uh, um, an adversary, built on a East Asian nation state that will remain nameless, um, but you can probably figure out who. Um, we kind of grabbed a couple of those higher level concepts around capabilities, and we built a technical axis around this, which were different modules that we wanted to exercise in PowerShell Empire and doing a couple other things. We wanted to be able to track adversary uh, infrastructure as well with SSL certificates, so we leveraged some technology to do that. We focused on some FTP and some DNS exfiltrations to exercise that as well. And so we went from there. The following year, Taedonggong, which is the name of our adversary group, came back. And so when you're emulating an adversary, we don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over again. But at the same time, much like a real life adversary, we don't want to scrap all of our TTPs and start over from scratch. Right? So we got to kind of reach a balance point. We kept PowerShell in place, but about 2018 timeframe, right? Uh, struts vulnerability. Anybody ever have to deal with struts and vulnerabilities? No? Good. Glad to hear it. Awesome. Um, struts vulnerability was out there. And, you know, people run Linux boxes in their environment, I think. It's not the year of the Linux desktop that's coming soon, I think. But, 
you know, uh, Linux boxes are out there. The first scenario we did was Windows focused. We said, well, that'd be interesting. What if we had Windows and Linux in the environment and there was some sort of a pivot between the two and we would go after a struts vulnerability on, win on a Linux box? Okay. What happens if we're, how are we going to monitor that Linux box? Do we have Sysmon for Linux? We do now. Did we have it in 2018? No. So how about OS Query? We'll use OS Query instead. Okay, the benefit of some of these things is by running these simulations and emulations, we're able to go ahead and also see what the logging fidelity of these systems are, which is again, what we're focused on, right? We're focused on that detection part of it and we wanna make sure that we can see that. The other thing we started doing was we said, well, what if Taedong Gong targets Frothly's AWS instances and their M365 and their Azure? Because Frothly's gonna start moving to the cloud. Remember that I talked about moving to those new terrains, right? 2018, if you guys think back to that, started seeing more people using AWS, right? I mean, it was around for a while. We saw Microsoft Cloud for a while, but we see more and more, more and more users moving their workloads to those places. So again, what we wanted to do was we wanted to start kind of picking at that and saying, okay, what kind of visibility do we get in those environments? And what can we see? What can we hunt? What can we detect, right? And that kind of was the trend with this. And so we built those kinds of things into it. Incidentally, we had two different operations. We had Operation Stout and Operation Logger, right? One was for AWS, one was for Microsoft 365, because of course you have to have operation names whenever you're doing, you know, you know, the nation state activity. Okay. Okay. Moving to 2019, um, we decided to ditch Tadong Gong. Uh, they had had a good run for us, but we had done two years of PowerShell Empire. We wanted to mix this up and do some other new things. So this is kind of when I took this over as a as my primary focus in terms of being the nation state. So the nation state I drew was uh, what a combination of Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear, and we called it the Violent Memes. Okay, that was your first 80s sad time you reference music. Um, so when you set up a nation state adversary, probably one of the first things to do, whether you're doing nation state or you're doing cyber criminal or you're doing insider, you probably wanna do a little bit of your research, figure out what you wanna make this thing be. So I started pulling threat intel. First thing I come across, aside from the years of Threat Intel reports prior to this, but this is 2018, uh, as we're kind of starting to form this up, come across this Mandiant um, report talking about weaponized link files. It's like, oh, we haven't done link files before. We did some spear phishing. I haven't done link files though. That'd be kind of interesting. Continue to do some reading. Microsoft. Uh, comes out with another report talking about targeting NGOs. They didn't say, hey, this is, uh, this is APT29, but they said, hey, this, this stuff's happening. Um, and I come out of a public sector background. So, well, okay, this is kind of interesting, kind of targeted some of the customers I worked with. And they were nice enough to put this diagram out there. And it kind of captured the, oh, okay. Start connecting the dots going, yeah, okay. Weaponized link file, uh, throws a decoy file out there, establishes a stage one. Cobalt strike, good. Yeah, this looks like something that we could, we could emulate. This looks like something we could do. And so this was good, you know, kind of good ideas to be able to start with. About that same time, nobody's heard of MITRE ATT&CK, right? Nobody's heard of it. Nobody heard it in the past two days either, I'm sure, right? 2019, MITRE ATT&CK is really kind of, I don't wanna say it's reaching that, reaching that crest, but again, MITRE ATT&CK's been around for a few years, but all of a sudden you're hearing MITRE ATT&CK everywhere, right? Um, and so one of the other things we were trying to do with this was to be able to kind of say, okay, how can, we, how can we do these things and also, again, help the blue teams to be able to start talking about this. The thing I like about MITRE ATT&CK is there is a symbiotic relationship, okay? Symbiotic relationship between the threat hunters, the incident responders, the security ops folks, the threat intel people. MITRE ATT&CK becomes that taxonomy, that common language that everybody can kind of speak in Right, and when I say that symbiotic relationship, okay, it's the egret and the cattle, okay, right. The idea is the cattle goes ahead and walks, stirs up the worms. The egrets eat those. Then the egrets take the little ticks and stuff that make the livestock uh, sick, right, and picks it off, right. That's the symbiotic relationship. I had somebody when I put this up for the first time say, "Who's the egret? Who's the bovine?" I'm not going to get into that. You guys can decide who's who. But at the end of the day, there is a relationship between these different groups that they have to work with one another and be, their success is driven by one another. Using attack as a common communication language can be very, very helpful. And so as we're building our emulation, we wanted to also start sprinkling in those attack techniques and sub-techniques now 
into this so we'd have that common framework to work off of as well. So, TAC Navigator, this is before the sub techniques, so it was a lot smaller at the time. APT 29 or 28, 29, 28. Therefore, there's my palette for the violent memes, okay? So this is my adversary technique palette that I'm gonna work off of as a starting point, okay? This isn't, I'm not gonna use all of these things, right? But I'm gonna see, okay, this is the kind of stuff I wanna pick and choose from to be able to work with. So I established a couple of high level goals. And I said, okay, if I can't get anything else done, what are the couple things that I wanna do? Well, I wanna use that weaponized link file, okay? I wanna try some domain fronting, okay? Now, if you read the, the, uh, the reports and, and the MITRE ATT&CK stuff, uh, the domain fronting that they were doing was with like a Meek plugin and doing it through Tor. And I was like, wow, that's pretty badass. Um, I'm not sure if I really wanna go to that level because here's the other thing. Again, I wanna help the blue team from a visibility perspective. If it's all encoded in Tor and HTTPS, what exactly are they gonna get out of that? Maybe I can just do domain fronting with some HTTP and say, you know, the adversary got lazy. What happens if you were able to go ahead and still see this going through and saying, okay, I've got this thing. Is there something in there that I can can I get into and figure it out? The answer is yes, by the way. Um, but, you know, let's go ahead and try to challenge them with some of that. I said, let's do some accessibility features. Of course, everybody do a golden ticket attack. That would be lovely. And I want to go ahead and go after the NTDS DIT file. Everybody knows what the NTDS DIT file is? Okay, that's this game over for the AD, right? At that point, I'm rebuilding. So those were kind of my five high-level pieces. So I'm happy to go into it. AD sad timey reference number two. First thing I ran into is I could not get my hands on a copy of Cobalt Strike. I wanted to buy a copy. I couldn't buy a copy. Separate conversation over beers. Um, PowerShell Empire, we had just spent two years doing. So my adversary is not going to be using PowerShell Empire again because I want to expose my end customers and analysts to new terrain. So we ended up settling on Metasploit. Okay. Now, I wasn't using looking to run Metasploit as being like, let's go run the modules of Metasploit and see what lights up, right? But it did serve a purpose to allow me to drop into Meterpreter and get to shells and those kinds of things. So it was nice and handy from that perspective. We had introduced the cloud in the past, right? Last year, we, we kind of just said a little SharePoint here and a little bit of uh, Exchange here, but we wanted to start building some Active Directory integration with Azure. Right, so we, uh, well, we set up Azure AD Sync, right? AD Sync is not the thing that's you know, preferred now, it's AD Connect, but AD Sync was there at the time, so we leveraged that. We also kind of set the bar for ourselves to say that all workstations were gonna workstation uh, Win 10 minimum, right? Not win, no more Win 7, okay? I'm not gonna even ask if people have Win 7 here. I'm sure if somebody does, that's okay. Again, you know, there's business needs for certain things. If you wanna emulate on a Windows 7 because it's, because it's low hanging fruit, that's probably not the reason to do it. But if you have them in your environment and you wanna emulate those kinds of things, use it as a teaching point for your analysts to say, hey, we're running this low hanging fruit over here. These are the things that are probably most likely to get popped. How can we better monitor around them, right? So if you use them, use them for a reason. But you know, in our case, we were trying to drive a little bit higher level there. So as we came up with the goals, as we started forming this out, built that diamond model to kind of say, hey, this is what we're kind of looking like. The capabilities were my goals, if you will, right? So that's kind of where we started from there. Um, doing the threat intel research, we said, hey, German-based digital ocean server sound like a good thing to do. We'll use Enom for our DNS. So trying to get and emulate that adversary uh, and off we go. Oh, wait, before we go, let's draw a picture to kind of help visualize this a little bit more. And this is, by the way, where that Thirsty Burner Brewery came in because we were going ahead and doing an ICS scenario as well. And so the, brew, the, uh, the, the brewing supply company um, bought the brewery to kind of help build this thing out a little bit more. So we have the brewery, right, which is running a local AD, syncing to Azure where the rest of Frothley's moved because we know that nobody, I mean, day one, when you buy a new company, all of their infrastructure is already in the new company's infrastructure, right? I mean, it, there's no transition. There's never like stuff here and stuff here and a six or nine month transition. That never happens, right? Okay, I'm a little concerned that everybody goes, yeah, you're right. That's, never, that's exactly what happens, right? No, no. So again, these are the kinds of little real world touches that we try to hit on. Um, you can see, you know, and the reason I, the other reason I like drawing pictures is because, you know, with, particularly with, particularly with APTs, there's a lot of stuff happening. There's a lot of things going on. I feel like there's a lot of misdirection. So if you can kind of draw this thing and help kind of visualize this, it makes it easier as we're getting into the next steps, which is writing our narratives. Now, 
People don't necessarily like writing narratives. Okay, so I'm not going to sit there and say you need to write a narrative. If you want to just do bullet points, right? Hey, I'm trying to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to have a checklist, so to speak. Okay, um, not a bad way to go. To be very frank with you, by the time I get to the cloud part of the attack, which is intended to be the very end of it, it got to the bullet point thing. I was just like, let me just, we're done. That's it. Okay, but going into it and writing a little bit more of a narrative, explaining what we're planning on doing mapping it to specific techniques, having the commands there as well, right? That gives me a way of being able to kind of put this all together. And it's also very nice to have this because when I come back to this in two or three months to write questions for a CTF, to educate users about specific pieces of this, it's good to have this context rather than, hey, I ran this command. Why did I run this command, right? The other thing that we've done is again, adding the techniques in there as well to help contextualize this. Now, for people who know attack very well and inside out, they were probably looking at this going, commonly used port is not a um, technique anymore. No, it isn't, but at the time it was, okay? So this is kind of the snapshots from there. The other thing that I've learned, and this goes into having the sub-techniques there because this was the following year's um, narrative and then, and then run book, if you will, um, was to start putting timestamps in there. And I found the timestamps being very, very valuable. And you'll see why this is in a little bit when I start talking about some of the other tools that I started utilizing was to be able to go back and find the data that we were actually logging, number one. Okay, so you run a scenario that's over multiple hours. You also happen to have background noise running because you have other workstations running at the same time. You have other servers running at the same time, right? Because you're trying to get this stuff lost in the noise. So going back and actually finding the commands that you ran is incredibly important. It's also incredibly important to understand what commands you ran, but then your logging tools did not see to say, hey, here's a potential blind spot, okay? So the ones in yellow, I happen to have both of these, right? One was a scheduled task and one was a registry entry and boom, boom, I had those. But I can tell you for a fact, um, specific, particularly this past year where I ran some PowerShell stuff through, uh, through Covenant um, and, and through a PowerShell uh, grunt that, um, or a PowerShell task through the grunt, it wasn't seen, it was invisible, That's right? So I go back to go looking for it, I can't find it. Um, not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because there's other things that happen downstream that I can write to and ask questions about. But when I was trying to ask questions about different comment tags and script block logging, and then the script block wasn't actually there, that was a little disappointing, okay? But those are the reasons why, as you're building out these narratives, it's important to go ahead and timestamp this stuff and understand where these pieces are. So I got done the, the, through that scenario. We ran through it. I'll talk about some of the lessons learned and some of the painful pieces here in a little bit. But here's the MITRE attack uh, that we ran. So how do we do? The yellow is the palette, if you will, okay? The orange ones were the things that the violent memes uh, did, okay, APT29 APT in this scenario. The red ones were things that were not identified in the MITRE attack as being things that they did, but things we did anyway. A lot of that was discovery kinds of things. And then at the time, um, the blue was the cloud, right? So MITRE ATT&CK had a separate cloud matrix, I think at one point before they started kind of rolling all this stuff together. And so the blue were some of the cloud activities that we did, okay? So as I look at this, I'm kind of like, yeah, all right. I did a pretty good job. I got, you know, I covered a lot of different things, covered a lot of different tactics, still a lot of yellow out there. So, hey, next year, there's some more opportunities to do on some different things. What happened in 2020, sure. right? Nothing. Uh, we all went to Zoom. So 2020, um, we start looking at this and start going, okay, what are we gonna do? What's our, uh, what's, what's our scenario gonna look like? Well, number one, I wanted to get off of Metasploit. There was no knock on Metasploit, but I wanted to try some other things. Before the pandemic, I got to uh, chat with a couple of threat intel analysts and some of the feedback I got around APT29 was, hey, there's a couple of specific uh, C2s that we're seeing um, seeing certain nation state actors using. Um, okay, tell us more. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and oh, by the way, we're seeing more focus on the cloud and we're seeing more, uh, you know, less customized tooling uh, and more just using the stuff that's there. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so living off the land, right? That seems like that's in play. That's another high level goal. Um, we're doing more and more PowerShell, but at the same time, we're not being fair to the defenders and giving them the ability, even though there's things like script lock logging that's available. So guess what we did for Frothly? Frothly got script lock logging, 
Okay, so again, we're trying to raise the defenders a little bit here by giving them additional capabilities too. Um, we move to Active Directory Connect, okay? And we um, built a bit of a more robust uh, Azure AD integration as well. And then my background initially was SQL DBA. Uh, that was the first job I had coming out of school. Uh, and so, you know, Azure was moving SQL to the cloud or had moved SQL to the cloud. And I thought that would be kind of something interesting. So I built a frothly customer database uh, in the cloud. And part of the overall attack scheme was pivoting to the cloud and then going after that. What would that look like if somebody had Azure auditing turned on? And okay, how does that look like when it's going to an event hub and then coming down into, in our case, into Splunk, but into whatever tool you're using? And when they start BCPing data out of that, what kind of visibility do I have? Because if I'm not BCPing to a box inside of my compromised environment, am I even seeing something going out of the cloud to some other third place? Those kinds of things are the kinds of questions that we're trying to answer. So we go through, we do this. Uh, oh, and by the way, the other part of this was the scenario again changed because who's in the office? No one, no one, right? Well, you know what? You got one or two guys coming in the office, right? You got on-prem stuff that you have to deal with, right? But they come into the office here and there. There's not much of a lateral movement kind of story here going from workstation to workstation because those workstations aren't on the same network, right? But so we, we augmented that story. We kind of crafted it and went from there. Fast forward to last year. What happened? What was in the news? Give you a hint. It's on the screen there. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, yeah, that thing. So uh, software supply chain seemed to all of a sudden be in the news. And so it seemed like that was an interesting place to go ahead and focus and to, um, to go after. And so um, Frothly decided to have an active directory federation, right? We did AD Connect before. The Lex logical thing is to up their game and say, you know what, we're gonna continue with that local on-prem because there's some stuff we just can't move to the cloud. We still have stuff on-prem, right? Again, never happens, does it? but we're gonna go ahead and have that ADFS and have that synchronization happening from there. Unfortunately, obviously, you know, that can get popped. What happens if that gets popped? Well, all of a sudden I have that golden SAML kind of attack available. What can I get to within my Azure environment with golden SAML? Well, let's see, okay? And so a scenario played out going through those things. We kept Covenant all the way through, by the way. Um, still kept doing some PowerShell, but also started building some more stuff into C-sharp. Did anybody see the invisibility cloak presentation yesterday? Okay. I wish I had that about nine months ago because that would have made my life a hell of a lot easier because I was busy recompiling and building uh, some C-sharp apps um, to be able to go through different kinds of things and make them less obvious. Uh, that would have made it a heck of a lot easier, but you know, it is what it is. Um, real quick, um, a lot of the work that I did with the graph API stuff and the attack on that, um, Roberto Rodriguez from Microsoft had done a, some nice stuff around Simuland. If anybody hasn't seen that, check that out. Uh, a lot of good information there to be able to go ahead and test that if that's something you decide that you want to noodle around with. So from a tool perspective, touched on a number of these different kinds of tools. Obviously, there's a couple of things that are C2s, uh, a couple of credential dumping tools, a lot of like standard Windows things that you'd expect to see in your environment. Um, so we did, we did touch on these things. There's a couple of other things that I've got out there that we did as well. But again, not focused on the, the custom malware pieces of this, right? Not focused on some sort of exotic tool sets, right? Focusing on kind of the base kinds of things that, that everybody has access to, um, to be able to do this. So, you know, if I'm trying to do this myself, I don't have to necessarily come up with those, with, with some of those, you know, more, uh, more exotic things, if you will. All right. So uh, sometimes the, uh, the presentation fairy comes and bestows good grace upon you. And so last week, as I'm sitting down, you know, kind of collecting my thoughts and trying to finalize my deck, Mandiant drops this report tying UNC 2452 to APT 29, right? So before they had kind of said, yeah, but we're not ready to say this is this and put them together. Last week, they dropped their report and said, yeah, this is the same thing, okay? So I started reading through the report and this was kind of a full kind of, you know, let's look at this again. Let's look at their OPSEC. Let's look at their history. We're folding these libraries of techniques together. And so I was able to kind of look at this and go, well, how do we do, right? 
And so I took a look at this and they kind of called out these high level concepts here. And the bullets that are there basically are tied to the observed trade craft. Okay. So varying intrusion vectors. They're saying APT29 uses a lot of varying intrusion vectors. On the right-hand side, they put their nice little picture. So I started looking at that and looking at our, our run books that we had. And we said, how do we do? Well, we, um, the first one there, I can't even see it on this screen. First one there is getting to the edge of my screen here, stolen credentials. Yep, we stole credentials, right? We did that. Uh, the next one was uh, phishing. We did the phishing, but we kind of stopped doing the phishing because phishing, 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 right? Yes, that's going to happen. Password spray, did that. Uh, supply chain, yep, did that. So we've kind of covered a nice range of their uh, different uh, initial attack vectors. The heightened OPSEC, there's a whole table of heightened OPSEC out there. Um, well, one of them in there is disabling logging. Clearly, again, from a detection perspective, we're not trying to get into that because if we did, we wouldn't have a CTF and we wouldn't have anything to workshop on, right? If there's no logs, we wouldn't be able to really kind of talk about it, right? We want to call out that, you know, if there's defensive evasion and clearing of, of, clearing of the audit log and those kinds of things, there's techniques to do that. Maybe I could go ahead and turn it off during the uh, emulation and say, hey, there was a window of time that the uh, logging got turned off. But obviously, if I just turn off logging, it's kind of self-defeating for the purpose that we're trying to up-level the analyst for, right? So understanding that they should, be, they should be looking for it. And if they see gaps in logging, that might be a concern. But I'm not just going to flip that off. Uh, sophistication. On-prem to cloud. Yeah, we did that. That's good. Uh, bypass MFA. That graph API attack with golden SAML will go blazing right through MFA. It won't care, flat out. You're in, you've got that ticket, you are doing stuff down at the, um, I was using Azure, it was using uh, AD, AD internals, Azure AD, or AD internals as the scripting, it's PowerShell scripts. You're literally just sending curl commands and sending API calls right underneath it. And that, that token that you have is blessed and good and through, and it's not gonna hit M MFA. MFA is gonna go right, you know, well, I don't care. You're good. You got the, you got the token. Um, it called out maintaining a light footprint. Can I come back to you? Okay. Can we come, let me come, I'll come back to you at the end of the slide. Um, this kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of validated the feedback that we got from the threat Intel analysts in the early, uh, a year and a half before that talking about lever leveraging stolen creds, abusing native Microsoft features, right? Those kinds of things. Speed and agility, we're not doing that, right? We're running a competition on a yearly basis. We're building content to help educate analysts. So I'm not trying to do this really, really super agile, right? I'm not going to go out and whip up another one to go ahead and, and, and build another attack. So that doesn't really apply to us. And then following the data, we don't do a lot of stuff with mail. Quite honestly, one time we tried to do mail, uh, we had Frothly send a bunch of mail to one another, which was great. But you know, at that, that point, how many people are going to send? You know, you're not going to send a lot of mail. So then what we did was we signed up a bunch of people to um, mail aliases, right? Or spam. You know, so everybody was getting spammed with stuff just to create more noise in our in our um, in our inboxes. Then we started realizing that our legal team was going to have issues around GDPR because of privacy issues if we actually published our data set and made them available that way. So we kind of got out of the whole mail business. So something to think about if you decide you want to do your own kind of thing with how you deal with mail and privacy issues. Anyhow, the long and short of it is we did a lot of focus on persistence, which is obviously something that APT29 was focused on. So I'd say we did okay with the following the data to establish that persistence as part of that. Yes, sorry. So I wanted to know, did you develop yeah, so let's see what time are we at now? Yeah, we're good. Um, yeah, so the challenge, the challenge that you have, and I was sitting in a session, I think it was Andy's session this morning, we were talking about some of that as well. The, Problem is, is the there are specific events that you will see the creation of the secret, the global, um, the, you know, the 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 user getting promoted to a higher level authority, the service principal getting these additional rights. Everything else, I'm gonna say everything else, but all that other stuff that's happening, you're blind to, you're flat out blind to, and. I was kind of surprised about that because when I got when I when I went through this time this last scenario, I went to pull it and started looking through my data. I'm going, I'm seeing these mile markers along the way, but I'm not seeing the 15 things underneath the surface that I'm doing to get to those next mile markers. And 
I was actually at a SANS forensics class in December and was talking to the instructor there. And the comment was made there as well was basically, Microsoft doesn't log at that graph API level. Or if they log, they don't make it available. But if you think about everything that's happening on the side of Azure, it's all graph API everywhere. It is. It's a tremendous blind spot. Thank you. No, that's good to hear. Um, but yeah, that's 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 the problem. If I can see the secrets being created, I can hit the global. I can see service uh, service principle gets the you know the the read write role right. I can get those things. Um, but yeah, there's then there's like I said, all that other stuff that's happening. All the you know um, even just creating the ticket itself, right? If I've got if I've got something from the ADFS initially, like the crafting of the ticket, not don't even see that, and then all of a sudden it's happening. So yeah, and it's 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 literally focus on those key milestones in the meantime until they've got something more verbose there. Yep, this is an eye chart. We could all agree to that, I think. Okay. If anybody can see that, that's great. I can't even see it. And it's like right here in front of me. Um, so this again is my kind of kind of that milestone evaluation going, okay, how are we doing with the violent memes? Um, this is the latest MITRE attack technique. This is the V11 stuff that just came out. Um, the stuff in white is is just I don't, I don't know how to get those stuff in white, which is the non-violent meme stuff out of there. Okay. The lightest blue stuff is basically my palette if you will. And then the darker shades are the frequency that we're using those things. Okay. So there's still stuff that we haven't really touched on, wasn't able to touch on, but we're hitting a lot of the key points all the way through this. And it was kind of a good way to be able to look at this over the past three years and kind of go, okay, are we hitting these different pieces? Are we getting coverage? Are we helping to educate our analysts on these different techniques? Because at the end of the day, again, my goal isn't just to get to the end of this and go, woohoo, I cracked it. Right? My goal is to be able to go ahead and generate data sets that I can show analysts, that I can test them, I can validate and say, yes, are you seeing this run DLL32 over here, this thing happening? Right, That's a technique that, that this adversary is using. Can you see this data exfiltration via cloud service? That's a technique this adversary is using, and so on and so forth. And that's what we're trying to do. So last 13 minutes or so, let's talk about some lessons learned. Another sad timing reference there. All right, so keeping it real, this is always a concern. Um, this is something I think we always spend a lot of time thinking about, is this realistic? Is this realistic? No, no, this can't possibly be realistic. I've kind of worked my way around to this to say, most of these things are gonna pass the realism test. Um, how many admins do you know that don't follow their own organizational procedures? Okay, I'm not asking if you're the admin, but you know, okay, that happens. Um, how many people sat through a cloud presentation in the past day and, you know, and sat there and said, that looks really cool. I have no idea how somebody configured this thing to make this happen this way and this way, right? Cloud configurations, misconfigurations happen all the time, right? Well, I can tell you, I set the stuff up and I'm just like, yep, okay, we're good. We're up. That's three buckets there. We're good. We're moving on, right? I'm not really locking that down. Safe to say that's probably what's happening in a lot of organizations. AV and EDR bypasses, hell, we probably sat, everybody probably sat through at least one, if not two or three sessions that covered different kinds of things like that, right? I mean, I, uh, Henry talked about some of that stuff. Andy talked about some of that stuff. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a, uh, oh, and then, and then of course, Brett yesterday talked about that. So right? I sat at least three sessions that talked about different kinds of bypassing these kinds of things. Misconfigurations happen, people are people. Don't make it too crazy. But safe to say that these things are going to be things that you can go ahead and say, yeah, we got this. Let's go ahead and work. let's go ahead and move forward with this. Okay. Things that work, current events, threat intel reports, utilize those things. Concepts that are talked about here. This becomes great fodder for being able to go ahead and build out your specific emulation. Um, if you're doing this for your own organization, right? Again, I'm doing it from a different perspective. I'm doing it kind of globally. Okay, so that's why we have one team doing insider, one team doing nation state, one team doing cybercrime, right? We're, we're kind of trying to address a much wider swath. Focus on your adversary and their capabilities. So if you're concerned about insider threat, focus on that, 
build out this process around insider threat, right? If cyber crime, cyber criminals are focusing on your environment and you want to emulate them, right? Pick that. Don't worry about making it a mirror copy. Anybody worry about shadow copies? How many ways are there to get to a shadow copy? One? No, no, not one, right? VSS admin, right? There's one, right? We could probably go around the room and find a few more. Expose them to different things. Don't keep going back to the same well over and over again, right? Again, we're not trying to, we're not trying to crack in and get to the capture the flag, right? What we're trying to do is show them the different ways that somebody can get to that ntds.dit file, as an example, right? We want to expose them to those different things so they go, oh, 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 whoa, oh, oh. yeah, we're going from here. Oh, I see where they're going. I see what they're trying to do, right? Let's expose them to those different methods. Use the network, use the endpoint. You want both of those things for visibility. Hell, this is a good way to go ahead and assess different kinds of technologies you're looking at onboarding. Okay, if you can go ahead and put it against your, uh, an emulation plan and say, hey, we're looking at this endpoint technology, but man, we can't see crap when it comes to this specific thing. Um, we had AV early on, the first couple of years, we did AV and built AV into our systems and everything else. And it was shocking, obviously, not, probably not shocking, but it was shocking that we saw such little value out of the AV, even though when we were like, yeah, let's just run some generic stuff that we knew would light it up. It just wasn't giving us enough telemetry to really go, wow, this is really valuable. So we actually stopped putting AV into our, into our, into our scenarios from a logging perspective, because it was just like, it isn't creating more value for the analysts. Let's focus on things that would create value, Sysmon, those kinds of things that would create that visibility for us. Um, balance the benefit and the burden. Um, if you look at MITRE ATT&CK, there's only so many initial access methods. And for those sitting in here yesterday or, or earlier, just the session before, we talked about phishing and the things that were happening over and over from a phishing perspective. There are people's jobs who literally have to click on stuff, right? That's their job. They have to open stuff from the ex outside. They're probably going to get phished a time or two, right? If you're stressing out about good um, initial access uh, techniques, Maybe you go ahead and say, you know what? Let's not burden ourselves with worrying about that part. Let's just assume breach at this point, okay? Because we know they have to click on something. We can play, we can, we can play the card of saying, yes, we know that this has happened. They're now in. Now let's focus on the rest of the kill chain. Let's focus on everything else that's happening after exploit, okay? If that makes it a little bit easier for you to get this thing set up and get benefit to the analysts, that's what you want to do, okay? Um, we boil the ocean. We have to boil the ocean because we're building these end-to-end -end scenarios. Again, I'm building, a, I'm building a competition. I'm building question sets. I'm building an education for an analyst. So I want to be able to do the whole end-to-end -end thing. But I'll tell you what, my life would be a whole of a lot easier if we could go ahead and just say, you know what, we're just going to focus on data staging and exfiltration today. Or we're going to focus on execution and lateral movement, right? Maybe just focus on a smaller subset of that and say, we're going to build on this and we're going to train on this and we're going to get our analysts better on this part or this combination. So it's something to think about there. Um, and then at the end of the day, keeping your focus on that, right? What are the things that, um, what are the things that keep you up at night, right? Um, those are the things to focus on if you're gonna go ahead and build an emulation. Now, when you prepare, you wanna test, test, test. This is where I go back to the unit testing. And I'm not saying necessarily the Red Canary stuff, but if you wanna use the Red Canary stuff, great. But when you're doing this, you have, a, you have a challenge here. You have to go ahead and make sure the tool does what you want it to do. You have to make sure that your logging, on the other hand, sees what you want it to see. And of course, you have your victim system that has to do you know, whatever it is to give you your gateway to the next spot. Okay. Once you do those little unit tests, if you will, then you want to test this thing end to end. Makes sense. Now, at the same time, you have to be prepared that something's going to break. Now, if you're doing your unit testing, you'll know pretty well where your potential problems are going to crop up. Um, is it the pivot from Windows to, to Linux that we talked about with Taedong Gong? Funny story about that. I was responsible for the Windows side of it. My colleague Ryan was responsible for the Linux side of it. He lives in Dallas. I live in Virginia. We met in San Francisco the night before and we said, hey, we never really built that pivot. And so midnight, we're sitting in the offices kind of trying to go, now, how exactly are we going to make this pivot work? Because we're recording this thing end to end. Those are the kinds of things that you want to practice ahead of time so you don't get to the day of and you're going through this. RDPing through a firewall, I'll just got a slide on that in a second. Exfiltration through a firewall. We had a Palo Alto in there that had some prevention on it and by golly, that prevention worked. 
we were trying to exfiltrate via FTP and we exfiltrated everything but literally the crown jewel, if you will, and it kept getting blocked. And so we ended up building a DNS exfiltration on the fly to try to get around that. Those things happen. Um, what happens when your C2 drops? Um, Covenant, I use Covenant for the past couple of years. I love Covenant. I decided to do an SMB where I kind of come in sideways, go, go with SMB to another system and move laterally that way. Um, worked great. I think I was memory, my memory utilization was strapped. It dropped the C2, right? This is when the persistence techniques that you stuck in there earlier on, just for grins to highlight to the analyst that these are persistence techniques you might actually find yourself using during your emulation because you need it. Otherwise, you're starting over from scratch. So those are things to keep in mind as well. Um, the sticky key one we did, the sticky keys, um, literally sticky keys. I thought that was kind of a cool, a cool image um, with powdered sugar on top. Um, we got four hours into this emulation, okay? I had multiple people doing stuff. Um, we had butts in seats on VMs emulating the frothly employees in San Francisco. We had our Thirsty Burner Brewery stuff in Colorado in a basement uh, running on a VMware, having two workstations over here that were being handled. Um, and we had a pivot that we were doing from the adversary to one of the Thirsty Burner systems to be able to RDP. And we got into that and I realized that because of the way we had our configuration, which I'll talk about virtual versus physical versus cloud in a second, um, we couldn't get there from here. And so we actually ended up building an RDP pivot on the, on the fly to get around the firewall that was there. And literally this was the article that we pulled and took a look at and, and, and came up with that workaround. These are the kinds of things that, you know, this is why this, the hair is this color rather than the color it used to be, um, because those things happen as you're doing it, right? And so the choice is, do you abandon that part of the exercise? Maybe. Do you start over from scratch? Do you stop tape? I mean, how do you do those kinds of things? So again, the more you can think about these things, the better off you'll be. Back to the analyst uh, to make, help make the analyst better. Give them some curveballs. If you have a junior set of analysts, right? Just the regular commands, mimicats.exe, totally fine, right? Maybe you change the name and you make them look in sysmon and see the original file name, right? Then you maybe start recompiling and making them start looking at switches. Then maybe you start moving and changing the switches names and make them start looking at the behaviors, right? Give them the curveballs. Don't keep feeding them the softball over and over and over again. Um, and of course, don't run in clear text. So one, the one, one year we did this with Mimikatz, I ran Mimikatz through the Metasploit module via Kiwi, did Mimikatz for uh, the Kerberos dump, and then actually Black Hills I had a, a blog that I went ahead and used that to modify PowerShell. So I gave them three different flavors of Mimikatz one year, right? Golden Ticket Attack I could do with Mimikatz or Rubius, but I gave it a twist and went ahead and used Rubius because Rubius was brand new at that point in time, okay? Uh, I wanted to see what Rubius would do. Rubius is now actually on the attack list of software as well. So I guess it's gotten to that point where it's like, oh crap, we got to, you know, we're, we're trying. So it's, it's reached that level of awareness. But again, with the example of credential attacks, being able to give them a couple of different flavors to expose them to these different things and don't let them just sit there and go, oh yeah, I see the name, I'm good. Oh yeah, I see the hash, right? The hash is, right, whatever. Uh, to recon or not recon. I don't care to recon. Um, for before initial access, unless I want to highlight sloppy tradecraft. Um, I'm more interested in showing recon after I get a foothold to go ahead and help educate them, right? This is the classic, do I see a ping and then a who am I? Or a who am I then a ping, right? Network guys do it one way. Nobody else really does it that way. Um, you know, an adversary would, why would an adversary look at who am I first and then ping? You know, that's, that might be a slight difference, but looking at things from that perspective. Um, Virtual cloud or physical, I don't care anymore. I used to care about this, but again, this kind of got back to the keeping it real part. I care about cost and I care about convenience, okay? Having servers in a VMware over here, two states away from me, having people here in a VMware, having some stuff in the cloud, it gets very confusing. Set it to something else. If it has VMNet in there, in the, in the log stream for the, um, for the network stack or AWS for the network stack, that to me does not matter. It might matter to you, but it doesn't matter to me. This past year when I did the ADFS stuff, I actually had a Azure, I'm sorry, Azure AD running, and I had my on-prem Active Directory in AWS set up with a VPC. I got good bandwidth, 
It was reasonably inexpensive. And I didn't have my security team calling me and going, why are you running these attacks on your workstation? Because my workstation was running VMware and they kept seeing this weird stuff coming into my system. So it made it a lot easier for everybody else. At the end of the day, you're not gonna be able to get to perfect. Don't worry about getting to perfect for the adversary. You wanna to get to that good enough, right? That you're helping up level your analysts. Stay focused on those goals that you have, okay? And beware of the risk of diminishing returns. When I built the software supply chain attack, I built a C-sharp app based on some MSDN article that I read and I customized the hell out of it. And I'm like, wow, this is really nice. And then I built my little DLL inject and I stuck that onto the thing and it created my callback and I was so happy. And then I looked at the log stream after we ran the emulation and I have about this much of that software shown in it. And I probably spent this much time in it. Right? Maybe if I'd done a CICD scenario as well, you would have seen more of it, but it was just that very small bit and the amount of time spent on that versus the payoff of what the analyst gained wasn't there. So keep those things in mind. Um, last set of thoughts, figure out your goals. The techniques will come along. I use MITRE ATT&CK. You don't have to use MITRE ATT&CK, use what you want. Um, use your threat intelligence though. Again, I use global threat intelligence because my my customer base is global, right? I have to do this for, for everybody. If you're doing it for your own organization, focus on your threat intel, focus on your threat itself. Individual techniques are fine. Individual techniques in concert with one another are better, right? Because again, I want my analysts sitting there going, oh, I see this, then I see this, and I see this. That's what I'm looking for is that chaining, okay? Identify the gaps in the data, improve that visibility by improving the logging. Once you have the logs, wrap it back to the security operations teams to get better detections. And at the end of the day, for goodness sake, the upper end of the pyramid is the stuff I care about. I buy IP addresses, I buy domains, right? I use them, I change them like shirts, right? The hashes, I compile something and I got a hash. I recompile it because I pull out a string and I got a different hash. I don't care about any of that stuff. My analysts don't care about those things, right? I want them to be looking at tools and TTPs and saying, what are the behaviors? What are the activities? What are the things that are being logged? And what can I go ahead and get better at from that perspective? If you want to go ahead and play around, and I realize I think I'm two minutes over, I apologize. Um, we have a platform out there called bots.splunk.com. We put some of our data sets up there. We put some hunting modules up there. We've got more stuff that we keep adding to it. If you ever play bots, this is the place you end up going to play in because of our scoring server. If you want to check it out, it's free. Feel free to play around with the data sets that are there. And with that, um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Thank you all for your time. Uh, this is, I've, I've kind of been building this thing out in my head and trying to improve upon this. So thank you for your patience as I kind of get through the rocky part at the beginning and kind of get into my flow because it's uh, still a little rocky on the front end. If you want to reach out to me or if you want to chat afterwards, I'll be here. I'll be here this evening. Um, we've got a few bot stickers up here if anybody wants any of that, but otherwise uh, open for questions. Yes, sir. What security conferences would you recommend individuals who are attempting to do What security conferences would. So, well, I was going to say, uh, literally, I sat, I've, I sat through at least six talks in the past two days, seven talks in the past two days that touched on elements of things that I covered today, like literally, I, and I, I think I only referenced about four of them, but things like this, I think would be tremendous. Um, yeah, um, I mean, so I'd say the B-sides ones can be good. They're, they're you know, I, that one's always tough because um, depending on how many tracks they have, I think some of those tend to be decent uh, in terms of some of the content that's delivered around those. Um, I think the, the DEF CON black hat combination, if, if you don't have the budget for the black hat part of it, the DEF CON part is certainly good from that perspective. I'd say some of the SAN summits can be very, very useful as well. Those are just places that I've been specifically. I'm sure there's a lot more that other people have here as well. So there'd be a couple I'd, I'd toss out there. Sorry? I, uh, yes, I understand. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to get into my, my stuff specifically. Yes, yeah, Splunk has a user conference as well. I'd say, though, we don't talk as much about this kind of stuff, though, just in, for, for all uh, transparency. So. Yeah, a little self-promotion.
I had that one big shield logo. That was probably as much as I felt comfortable doing. Okay. Anyone else? All right, well, I'll be here for a couple more minutes if anybody wants to chat offline otherwise. Thank you.